just wanted to welcome everyone to today's shop talk, Cultivating Patron Connection. This is meant to bring together current, emerging, and aspiring arts professionals to talk about their areas in performing arts field. Today, our focus will be audience services and front of house operations uh, and how we as a field uh, or a subfield are moving forward uh, in our existing circumstances and, and sort of the evolving circumstances uh, after COVID. Uh, I am, my name is Rebecca Black and I am the audience services manager at Carolina Performing Arts. Before we begin, I would like to let you know that this conversation is being recorded and will be distributed at a later date. By participating, you are granting consent to be recorded. If you have a question, uh, please use the raise hand function. Um, you can do that at any point during our conversation. Uh, and the option can be found at the bottom of your screen when you open the participants menu. Our host will call your name, at which time you may voice your question. If you are unable or prefer not to use your own voice, you may type your question in the chat and it will be read aloud. Read aloud. Um, we do ask that you keep yourself unmuted and use your video as much as possible just to keep the conversation easy and informal. And without further ado, let's go ahead and get started by introducing our three facilitators. We will start with Michaela. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michaela Ashworth. I am the Director of Audience and Event Services at Durham Performing Arts Center. We are a 2700 uh, seat venue located in downtown Durham. Uh, I think we're in our like quasi 13th season, I guess, if you can call this a season since we're not currently having shows. Um, uh, we host a variety of uh, different events from Broadway, concerts, comedy, family events, um, some family events I wish we didn't have, including Peppa Pig, which while the kids love it, it just gives me a headache. Um, uh, I think one of the more interesting things about our venue is we have both uh, paid part-time staff as well as volunteers. Um, so we kind of have a little bit of everything going on. Um, yeah, and super excited to be here today. Thank you so much, Michaela. Um, Sean. Thanks. Uh, happy to be here. I'm Sean Wright. I'm the executive director of the Grand Theater in Wausau, Wisconsin. Uh, well, we're excited because it has made it above zero today. Uh, we are a 1,200-seat historic uh, house built in 1927. There's actually been a venue on this site since 1889. Uh, and we present everything from you know, Broadway to concerts to family programming, uh, robust rental business, community events, resident companies and such. And I've been at the Grand now a little over six years, uh, previous stops at Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama, Washington University in St. Louis, and I actually am a, a proud Carolina alum, uh, master's degree in 2004 in sports administration, totally right what I'm doing right now, but uh, you know, prepared me for this field and uh, happy to be here for the conversation. And last but not least, Kate. Hi, everyone. I'm Kate Lorenz. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Director of Events and Audience Services at the Leeds Center of Kansas. Um, we have Leeds Center in Nebraska as well, but we're the Kansas one. Um, we are a 2000 approximately seat presenting theater on the university's campus. Um, we have our own Leeds Center series. We do a lot of shows with the School of Music in a normal year, um, a lot of rental events, including dance recitals and um, other things with community groups. Um, I actually filled in uh, when Rebecca had it out, um, so I am sitting in her old office right now because um, it's, it's quiet and, and serene, and um, yeah, I'm very excited to be here and just have a conversation about how we've uh, made changes and adjustments and how we are looking forward, so thank you. Yeah, so I think I'll just launch the conversation with how are you doing? What is what is the state of your organization right now? Um, we'll start with Sean. 
Yeah, it's been a, a very interesting 11 months. Uh, you know, our, our theater, we've been completely dark since uh, March 13th of last year. We literally had uh, opening night of a sold out run of Waitress on our stage uh, when we made the call in conjunction with the local health department to shut it down. And so, oh, there are bad feelings. And then there's taking a show that's just been loaded in off your stage. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, I, I'm really proud of, of what we've done as an organization. We've done uh, over 120 different virtual events, everything from, uh, you know, a curated series that we call the virtual stage to uh, community engagement events. You'd never believe how happy people are to have uh, 80s trivia or Disney trivia coming up or holiday trivia. People are, you know, people are craving that sort of interaction. And, uh, you know, we provided opportunities for our high school students uh, who are part of our musical ensemble who did not get the chance to perform. We actually created a web series for them uh, called The Best of Broadway. And, and so, you know, uh, we've done a lot of programming. And I think the thing that I'm most proud of is just we've, you know, I went into this, you know, not knowing that it would be a year, a year plus, but as we got into it saying, I wanted to make sure as an executive director that we preserve the organization, that we can continue to serve the community and that, you know, as much as I could, I protected our team. And, and I'm proud that we've been able to do those things. We've definitely served the community. We're, we're vibrant, even though we're, we're physically dark, uh, you know, dark but not closed is what we're saying. And we've been able to, uh, you know, I switched from a operations programmer, everything hat to almost a full-time development hat. And with the monies that we've raised, we've been able to keep our staff on board and keep everybody here. And so, you know, Hopeful, I guess, is the word that we're all holding on to right now. Hopeful that come fall, we're back in business. But uh, yeah, you know, it's it's been. You know, I can't say that it's always this hopeful. It's been a roller coaster, and I'm sure there are probably a few more uh, ups and downs before we get to that that exciting day that we're all hoping for when we can safely reopen. Yeah, when I'm hearing you talk, I feel like I am both. Uh, in admiration of all that you've taken on and all the responsibility that you had, but also um, a little envious that it seems like you've been able to keep a little bit of control of the situation um, with you and in your hands and being a part of the a University of Kansas, right? Um, uh, you know, we've been dealing with the state financial situation and the university's financial situation. And there are so many, there's so much uncertainty um, you know, um, many spheres of uncertainty being a, being a theater on campus. Um, I think we are, we are, you know, when, when we first shut down as well in March of last year, I know a lot of us were kind of scrambling to um, get more hand sanitizer stations in place and get masks and, you know, build sneeze guards and all of that, thinking that we might be able to open back up what in May or June with some safety protocol. Um, but then, you know, pretty quickly it switched to more of the long game. Like we know this is gonna be a long time. How do we stay engaged with our, you know, our donors, our attendees, our volunteers? Um, how do we maintain relevance on campus and a useful function there? So, you know, I think uh, again, um, like Sean was mentioning, we had, um, we've done some virtual events. We actually did some outdoor, small distanced pop-up shows when the weather was nice. Um, and so, yeah, I definitely feeling both nervous and uncertain, but also really proud of what the LEAD Center has been able to do um, during this time would be, uh, would be my nutshell of emotions right now. <laughs> yeah. Kate, you mentioned the hand sanitizers and I'm laughing because I have like a closet full of them. Um, the touchless like automated and I was sitting there thinking the other day, like when we finally do reopen, I'm gonna have to replace all the batteries in them because it's been so long. Um, <laughs> you know, little trivial problems like this. Uh, yeah, I, we've been super fortunate. The majority of our team has been able to stay on. It's been difficult connecting with some of the part-time staff and the volunteers, I would say that engagement isn't as much as I would like to look, but I'm in inspired by Sean's uh, trivia night. I think I might give that a whirl in the next couple months or next couple weeks. Um, but yeah, the energy is definitely different, but hopeful. Um, I am grateful that, you know, everybody on my team is staying really optimistic and, you know, we 
are really excited to open. We could probably open tomorrow, like if we were allowed to, um, as ready as we are. But um, hoping to have a show sometime in 2021 um, and really excited about what that might look like um, as far as some of the restructuring we've done and as far as what we are trying to do to, you know, make everything better for our audience once we do open our doors. So, so Sean, why don't you tell us a little bit about your trivia nights and so maybe some, maybe each of you could talk a little bit about this idea of engaging with our audiences in a virtual space and what that has really meant. You know, we're, we're so used to thinking about audience engagement in uh, sort of front of, hopper, front of house operations as like emergency preparedness planning and ticket scanning and greeting people and just double seating service. issues. <laughs> yeah, double seating issues. <laughs> yes. Um, and, you know, long lines at the concession booths and all of those things that we are used to, to dealing with and thinking about and planning for. Um, how are, I mean, we all sort of had to jump in this to the deep end very quickly and, and learn, relearn how to think about audience engagement in a virtual setting. And I'm just interested to see how that experiment has gone for you all. Yeah, I, I would say for us, it's, it's been, you know, I, in some ways, because as you said, we, we all jumped into the deep end, it's been a little freeing. You know, we've, we've tried stuff, things have worked, things have run their course. I mean, early on we were doing a Broadway watch party where it was Broadway titles that are on you know, Netflix, Hulu, wherever, some that were just over the air and said, hey, we're all gonna sit down and watch this at you know, fr 7 p.m. Friday night. And my marketing team would engage people on Facebook with you know, what's your favorite song or uh, fun facts about the show. And the first probably half dozen times we did that, the engagement was crazy because it was at a time when people were just craving any way to, to interact. Well, as summer and, you know, we took a little time off in the summer, we tried to start it back up in the fall and it was, it was done. They had run its course. People were over it. And so it was like, well, what else can we try? Well, hey, let's try a trivia night. And, you know, and, and have these ideas, you steal them from other venues. This is what you do. And you find out that, wow, first one, you have 10 people and you go, okay, this is just kind of be what it is. But then the next one, you have 30. And all of a sudden you have people, you know, chiming in from halfway across the country. And it's, you know, uh, you try, we've done some virtual shows and we found, we thought that people would really like the, hey, make it a dinner and a show and a show program. And people were like, nah, the fun of a virtual show is I watch it when I want to watch it unless I can live interact with the artists. So now we've pivoted to more virtual offerings that are, here's Michael Cavanaugh, who we were supposed to have on our stage live from his home studio. It's just him and a piano, but he can read your Facebook comments and say, no, I, I, I don't know that Billy Joel song or, you know, or I can't sing that Elton John song without a band because I can't hit those notes. I mean, and, and uh, you know, and, and so what we found is that the audience, I guess the best way to put it is, as, as you said, an audience engagement, we always think about it as we have our policies and our rules and our things to make the audience, you know, experience better what we found in this is in the virtual world the audience kind of lets us know what <laughs> they want to do and what they don't want to do and i mean and we could sit there and continue to say well no we're not going to do x or y because this is what we do instead we went oh okay sure and this is the audience wants right now let's do it We've, uh, on that note, we've found that for some of our virtual shows, we've still continued to try to send um, a, a post-performance survey, a kind of customer satisfaction survey. And um, in previous days, you know, we would kind of chuckle over some of the comments saying it was too loud and some of the comments saying I couldn't hear anything. Oh, um, and, so, <laughs> and so now with the virtual engagements, it's some people saying um, the chat was distracting. We didn't like it. And other people <laughs> saying I love being able to chat. So that's a little bit of still that beautiful uh, range of human reactions to things um, that we're still getting, even with the virtual engagements. Yeah. Uh, one of the most interesting things that we've been doing is a uh, poster giveaway. 
Um, so our social media manager has been super amazing through this whole time trying to engage everyone. Um, and for every show that we've ever had, we get custom hatch print posters that are super cool. Um, we have a hundred printed. So depending on the show, like if the artist is like, oh, that's great. I'm going to take 90 of them. It's like, okay, they have 90. Um, so there's a lot of times where the audience doesn't really either know that there's a poster available or see it. Um, so about a month ago, they started giving some of our like hidden stash away. And in order to do that, you actually have to comment like, you know, why do you deserve this? Or tell us some of your favorite memories with this artist. Um, so, I mean, it's been really great just allowing the audience to kind of relive their experiences. Um, and some of my favorite uh, has been to read the comments that are like, the staff was just so great. Like, I miss them. They're like my long lost family. Um, or just like some of them reminiscing how like, you know, I got engaged that night. It was so great. Or one woman who was like, I was nine months pregnant and I had my baby the next day. I almost gave birth to that pack And I'm like, oh gosh, like that <laughs> didn't happen. But um, having everybody kind of live through, like take a trip down memory lane has been really great to see. And just to like know that like, even though they're not coming to our venues, our venues still hold like a super important place in their life. Um, and just arts and entertainment in general. Um, adds to the hopefulness and the positivity around. I think, uh, yeah, talking about sort of silver linings in a way, um, one of the things, if we want to talk about this a little bit, I know it's come up in some other um, conversations with, with people at performing arts centers, but just that um, accessibility factor for virtual engagements and um, maybe thinking what have we innovated on that we can keep um, in some aspect, um, you know, to make our performances more accessible to folks who might not feel comfortable driving at night or might not, you know, there might be a, um, you know, a, a financial barrier or something. Um, and as well, we, so we combine front of house and ticketing um, into one audience services department at Lead Kansas. And so I've been able to help with both some of the front of house stuff ish um, this season, but also ticketing and selling socially distanced tickets to shows that we were hopeful might happen and then having to call the ticket holders and let them know that um, the shows had had to be rescheduled for next season. And we were all sort of dreading those phone calls. Um, but as Michaela and Jada mentioned, it was, um, all, it was also an opportunity to connect with people, you know, to make those calls, say, we're really sorry, thanks for sticking with us. And almost everyone has been incredibly understanding and has been able to share, you know, we miss you so much. Um, you know, thanks for calling. We appreciate the the contact and um, so one thing that we were somewhat dreading even that has had a kind of customer care you know connection side to it that has actually been nice. Kate can you actually speak about the social distanced um, sort of pop-up performances that you mentioned and what mm -hmm. how that idea developed and how you made it happen and sort of what artists you were presenting that just sort of tell us about that process yeah sure so we um the goals of these outdoor pop-up shows we had a few goals one to be able to use some of our artist um you know our artist fee funds to support artists during this time um, who we knew were hit really hard um especially artists in our area um also to um you know stay visible in the community and to connect with our ticket holders um so we created a series we do kind of a few at a time planning wise just to make sure everything was working out. Um, but we would work with um, uh, community members and university members and some of our um, friends of the lead board members to kind of host a um, performance at their house or in their neighborhood uh, where we would basically kind of get the word out through them to a small group of people. Um, so 45 people was the guideline for university events. We needed to stay at, at or under that number. Um, our graphic designer made amazing uh, yard signs with the six foot trom trombone saying six feet apart, please. Um, everyone wore masks. We had masks that we brought. Um, we brought a hand, some hand sanitizer stands and, um, you know, we, we, we um, somewhat relied on the attendees to 
group themselves in kind of family units or pods or be able to sit with whomever they were um, they were sharing space with at that time. But we have we had um, Ashley Davis, who's a, um, an Irish singer. Uh, she's American, but she sings Irish music and she's from Lawrence. Um, she did a few shows. We had um, uh, Vanessa Thomas. She's an amazing vocalist who can sing anything. Um, and she uh, had, she did a few shows. So we worked with Four, two, four or five artists and each of them did a couple shows and kind of got into the groove. Our tech staff um, in some cases provided sound support. Um, so yeah, it was kind of a small but still professional um, operation. And um, for me, it was a little, I'm not used to the, and I'm sure several of you feel the same way. I'm not used to the planning two weeks at a time thing. <laughs> I'm used to, um, you know, the whole season and I can get my ushers and I can get my house managers and everyone's scheduled. Um, but it was great to be able to kind of roll something out, starting with our friends and lead board members, but then move to, we did a couple of shows at preschools and, you know, made sure that we were hitting different areas of town and um, yeah, and, and that these performances were both small and safe, but also accessible and uh, to, you know, to everyone in our community. What kind of, what kind of staff other than the production staff did you have there? We would have, um, our executive director would always go and, you know, thank people for being here and hosting. Uh, usually our associate director would go. Um, and then uh, um, one to two people from our front of house um, slash ticketing group. Um, our development director would go since there was usually a, an element of that sort of interfacing. Um, and then, yeah, so that's about five of us. Um, and we'd usually have, everyone wanted to go, you, everyone on our full time staff wanted to go to at least one or two to kind of be able to just see people <laughs> and get, get in the groove and experience it. So yeah, we had, um, we had a, uh, besides the tech staff, there were certain people who always wanted to be there, but really we just somewhat rotated um, as a full-time staff. Um, we at that time didn't have students on campus. Um, we didn't have students um, really working those shows. Um, and I think there was um, at that time, perhaps still now um, a little bit of a like, certain groups were testing positive at a higher rate. So we did kind of keep that to a full-time staff, um, uh, you know, running the event on those. Um, Michaela, I want to kind of go back to something that you had mentioned in this, and, and you as well, Sean, this idea of what's special about our events and our engagement with, with patrons is, is different now. Um, and Michaela, for you, I think especially you're a large venue in really close to downtown. Um, I suspect you see a ton of sort of one-time buyers or like once a year visitors, those kinds of, mm -hmm. of patrons coming through. How are you, and Sean, you as well, I mean, you're located in a downtown area as well. So like, how are you, um, how are you thinking about patron engagement for folks who aren't now able to visit you and, and make that part of an annual tradition? Yeah, um, I would say even in the past, uh, we always look at every um, event sort of through the lens of, you know, if this is a first time visitor to Durham, um, first time visitor to our venue, how is this going to look for them? Um, and then as far as moving forward, we're going to keep that lens um, always at the forefront of our focus. Uh, but the biggest thing is just knowing that now these people are putting their trust in us. Um, they're only going to come back to our venues if they feel safe um, for a variety of reasons, but especially with COVID on the mind. Um, and we can't take advantage of that trust. Um, and so as we prep and, you know, try and tweak things, once we do open up, I know we're going to have to, you know, revisit, you know, does this policy make sense? Like, should we actually change it? Is it actually keeping the guests safe or is it doing something that is really nonsensical? Um, so really just trying to make sure that every day, every time we open our doors, if somebody is brand, brand new to, again, our city, our state, our venue, that they feel safe, comfortable, they know exactly where they need to go, they can always find a staff person to assist them, um, anything like that. Yeah, being, you know, being a part of the downtown, I think we decided fairly early on that 
you know, that second part, obviously very important, but we need our, our downtown to survive, uh, you know, to get to the other side. And so we started thinking about what can we do to help, you know, use, use our megaphone uh, of all those people who normally would be coming to Wausau to stay at the Jefferson Street, to have lunch at the Mint, have dinner at Red Eye, come to a show, and now, you know, those things are out the window. And so we actually, uh, you know, one of the first things we did was we, we started a, a pop-up series of our own this summer that we specifically went to uh, these places in, around the downtown who had, you know, uh, had to essentially create their own outdoor spaces, their outdoor safe spaces. You know, the brewery and coffee shop who had this beautiful space, an old Masonic Lodge, and they suddenly had a beer garden. It's a parking <laughs> lot. It's a giant parking lot with some uh, barrels that they put in. And I mean, I mean, literally the first time you went there, they were still stringing lights across and going, somebody's got to go to Menards, we don't have enough. And and so we had a, a, you know, we started the concert series there, a distillery that had that, there was a restaurant that, you know, had had a, uh, you know, we took over their parking lot for a, for a show. And the idea being, you know, what can we do to, to help these folks? And then when we started the virtual shows, which restaurants can we partner with? And, you know, because we need them to be here. That is, a, that is for a market like ours, a lot of the allure that people have is that they can come here they can stay they can walk to the theater they can have dinner beforehand have drinks afterwards you know we you know we we've tried to cross market with the ski hill because the ski hills obviously had a great year they've had a huge year because mm -hmm. people want to be outside and you know and now moving forward we're trying to think about you know how can we uh you know get those folks back who you're right are, are one-time visitors and uh, you know how can we who may have broken the habit. We, we worked really hard, I feel like, over four or five years to get those folks in the habit uh, of coming to Wausau and you know, uh, from all across our region or coming up from Chicago to ski at Granite Peak, but then come to a show at the Grand on, on, you know, on Friday night. And so we're having to think about how can we, as we move forward, you know, sort of redouble our efforts toward those people and, and figure out a way to get them back <laughs> because it, it takes a lot of work to get those first time, first timers here. And, you know, I am afraid that we've lost some of them and it's going to be a challenge to, to get those back. Uh, you know, much as, as Kate was talking about our, our subscribers, our, our, our core people, they have hung in, they've, you know, changed my ticket seven times. Okay. I'm just excited yeah. to come back, but you know, it's, it's those people who, you know, one visit to town on a Friday night to see Charlie Barron's on their way up north that we've got to figure out a way to, uh, to, to reach those people. So, so that makes me think about a, a whole bunch of different stuff, <laughs> um, but what does it mean for us to, so, okay, here's the question. We, we are used to creating that trust through a variety of our traditional operations. Mm -hmm. And now there's just a bunch of unknowns. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know what audience behavior is gonna be like, what their expectations are gonna be like, if and when they come back. Um, we just, there's a bunch that we don't know. So how are you all planning? And how are you, or how are you all thinking about that need to rebuild that patron trust um, for their safety, but also just for the experience that they'll have a good time. Um, how are you how are you working on on planning and preparing for that for whenever we do get patrons back in through our doors? I know that several of you are like even considering or, or in Kate's case have have actually done some restructuring. And I'm just interested to know if some of that is intentional for this effort or for some larger efforts and how that plays into our, our future as hosts of ac actual live events. I'm having a few kind of different thoughts. Um, so the restructuring that we did to combine front of house and ticketing was in the works before, but um, we proceeded during the, the pandemic era. And it was actually really helpful. One of the reasons, um, benefits of doing that is to have just a deeper understanding of both 
departments. Um, and so then all of a sudden, not just me, but many of our full-time staff members became the ticket office staff because we didn't have students anymore. Um, and so that actually was really helpful in thinking about how we were going to do seating and, um, you know, how we were going to proceed with um, as much safety as we could kind of build in while hoping we would be able to have some performances. Um, so th I think that continuity was really helpful. I think it's kind of going forward. I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about moving forward as a combination of what we did before with our planning and um, intense, you know, here's our protocol, here's our training, here's what we do, here's how we deal with X situation, here's how we deal with Y situation. And then the flip side of what Sean was talking about with the virtual performances where now to more of an extent, the audience is telling us what they want and what they need. Um, so I think that it's kind of gonna be a combo um, of almost, putting in double energy to be just as diligent with our side of things and just as responsive and open to listening to the audience side. So I guess I'll, I'll stop there for the moment. I think, I think you're right. Yeah. I think that the audience is going to be the, the biggest sort of challenge, you know, as, as we go into this, because we, we all are going to have policies and procedures and you know and I think some of us have taken this I know we have taken this opportunity to perhaps introduce things that our patron base might be a little bit slower to adapt you know like digital ticketing but we also know we have to listen to the audience and not say we're going from all paper tickets to all digital tickets bring your phone and you can't come to a show because that's just not going to happen overnight and but I also think it's okay you know it's going to be okay for us to you know, to listen to the audience and, and see what their thing, what their needs are. And, you know, on, on my end, I, as, as a programmer as well, it's starting those conversations with, you know, with agents and with producers to say like, listen, you're going to have to understand that this idea of, you know, if somebody calls me and says, I don't feel sick or I don't, I feel sick. I don't feel safe coming to a performance. The old rule of no refunds, no refunds. I mean, uh, we're going to have to, that's gonna to have to change in a post COVID environment. And so you can't call me and say, well, I looked at the audit last night and there's two fewer tickets sold today than there was last night. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, I, we're all gonna to have to figure these things out together. And there's gonna to have to be a, you know, a, a, there's gonna be a learning curve, I guess is the best way to put it. So you can prepare, but <laughs> if the last year's taught us anything, preparation's nice and <laughs> then we all blow it up and start over again. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't know much, how much more I can add based on what y'all already said. I mean, you really touched on all of it. It's really just going to be about patience and learning from the audience, allowing us to, you know, change things on the fly if we have to, but then also knowing that it will uh, be a learning curve. We will have to update, you know, whether it's nightly, weekly, monthly, but it's just, it's going to be an ever-changing landscape. <laughs> So Michaela, is there anything specific that you're like, kind of daydreaming about trying? <laughs> um, well, speaking of digital ticketing, we are making that move. Um, so we're trying, we, you know, got the new uh, touchless ticket scanners. So it's going to be, we've already talked to um, the company that we ordered it from to try and make some, you know, guest friendly videos on how to download the ticket. Um, on your mobile phone, how to pull it up. Um, we're ordering a custom tent. So that way we can have some of our front of house staff, including um, ticketing stand under the tent. So it's like, before you get to the venue, visit the ticket tent. Um, so that way they can walk you through how to uh, pull your ticket up. Um, I think the other big like daydream of mine, or at least what kind of keeps me up most nights is uh, we're actually taking our cleaning in house um, so typically we had contracted out and used uh, various third party venues to clean. Um, and that was always a trial and error. Um, it's a tough feat cleaning a 2,700 seat venue, um, especially when we have shows constantly, almost every day. Um, so we're actually gonna take our housekeeping team internally. Um, that's one of our department restructures. So. I've been working to write job descriptions and structure that and figure out what the schedule will look like and 
how we can present this budget to shows and say, hey, like when you came last time, it was this fee and now it's going to be this. And here's why we have that change. I promise it's for the better. Um, and we're hoping overall it will allow us with a little bit more, not just flexibility, but a little more control over, you know, ensuring that the venue is clean and sanitized um, for when guests come in. Um, so we're hopeful, but again, every every now and then again the panic I think like seeps into my bones of oh gosh it's a whole nother like team that we're gonna have to hire and train and make sure that they're you know welcomed in our environment and feel comfortable and want to stay on with us so it'll be it'll be good but big <laughs> yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges of this when we when we all get back to business is that I think a lot of times you know when when changes are made operationally they're done so sort of in a siloed manner you know it only impacts the front of house or it only impacts the ticketing or it impacts front of house ticketing if you combine them and production that's its own world that doesn't you know the streams do not cross we're all going to be in a world where all of those are going to have to to work together and are going to have to adjust to you know whatever things are new and different and you know the days of I go, oh, yeah, sure. Everybody just walk through the green room and, you know, grab whatever you want out of that. They're, they're not going to happen. And then you have the, well, who does that, belong, that space belong to? And who's going to police that? And, uh, yeah, I, I think that that's going to be one of the real challenges. That, uh, and, and maybe a good thing. Maybe it's okay that we, we get out of our respective uh, silos within the venues themselves and work together, as, as strange as that will be for some of the longtime veterans. Well, I think uh, you bring up a good point because I think part of what we've been thinking about is, um, you know, in trying to make, trying to reopen and um, give customers and patrons a safe experience. You know, there are certain things that we can't be flexible on and that we can't, you know, compromise on in terms of, um, you know, safety of our of our venue. And then thinking about who then does that fall to to enforce those. Um, you know, that safety protocol. Um, and it may not be appropriate for, you know, volunteer ushers to be taking some of that on. It may not be appropriate for, you know, students to be taking some of that on um, potentially, especially if a situation were to escalate. Um, so that would mean more on hands, all hands on deck for um, potentially other full-time staff members to uh, to pitch in and do a little bit more of that um, audience interfacing in those aspects. And as well, you know, we don't know how many, um, I don't know about you all, but many of our, most, if not all of our volunteer ushers are in an older, um, more at-risk age group. And so we just, quite frankly, don't know how how many will have back who will come back i've talked to many who say i i want to come back so badly but i don't know you know if i'll be able to um and i think that extends to our certainly at lead kansas that extends to our audience uh, um, as well and so um in both of those situations we want to make sure that we are staying engaged and giving people the best, safest, um, most accessible opportunity to still come to our events. But it is also giving us an opportunity to think like, who have we not been talking to to volunteer? Um, what communities have we not been engaging with? What communities have we not been marketing to, um, either from a programming standpoint or from a, you know, um, just being a welcoming um, space to come into? So for me, um, there are some really exciting aspects of that new thinking um, as well. Yeah. So all of that, Sorry, go ahead. Thanks. Um, all of that brought to mind a couple questions for me on the, you know, listening to audiences. Have any, has anyone actually surveyed audiences to see kind of where things are? And then on the digital ticketing side, what is, what is the accessibility like for that because I know some of our patrons um, we do have some long-standing patrons who are blind or low vision and I was just talking with them yesterday about some of the challenges and barriers with some of the digital programs and I wonder how that will translate to that digital touchless ticketing as well. Yeah thanks Jamie. Um, I Michaela, can you can you speak to since you seems like maybe you're the newest with the digital scanners? Yeah, um, so we're really fortunate. We partner with uh, Arts Access, which is a uh, arts-based nonprofit in Raleigh. 
um, who deal with um, accessibility all the time. And we are, again, super blessed that we are able to reach out to them with lots of questions. Um, we're actually planning on when we do have a reopening date um, set in mind and we can bring some of our staff back, um, we're gonna have Arts Access work with us on you know, figuring out best practices for that. Um, we also know from a, not just with blind and low vision, but a different accessibility side, uh, we do have some patrons that don't have smartphones and they're just not going to get one. Um, so allowing for uh, paper ticketing um, is always going to be able uh, to be requested. Um, I think that, uh, I think our box office, I remember at one point the conversation was, uh, especially for our season seat holders to leave a note in there. If they're not gonna have digital tickets, they'll have it printed so that way they can come to the box office or um, our front of house will hold the paper tickets for them. Um, and I did also wanna speak to your question. We, I know we personally have done um, a couple of different audience surveys so far. And I know that there's been a couple of general ones that um, different organizations have put out as well. And overwhelmingly audiences do wanna come back. Um, the big question is on when, it's not really an if. Um, most uh, guests have been indicating that, you know, once the vaccine is a little more widely distributed, they'll might, they might feel safer. And another big indicator was as long as uh, we have a mask requirement. Um, we were shocked. I'm pretty sure it was either, uh, I'm throwing around random numbers, but I know it was either in the upper 80s or low 90s, um, the percentage of people that were like, I'm only going to come back if you have a mask requirement for all guests and staff, um, which was in interesting to see as well. Sean, are you seeing similar responses? Yeah, we've been surveying audiences all the way back since, uh, since early April and then part of the uh, the national cohort with a lot of other venues and yeah it's real consistent that people want to come back uh, and they want to come back in their usual manner you know they don't want to come back in pods of two or four uh, you know and things like that they want to come uh, you know they plan to they want the usual programming uh, you know and one of the things that's consistent is there's a question would you like different programming more lighthearted programming programming that makes light of the pandemic and people are like no i want you to bring hamilton and i want you to bring uh home free and yeah and you know and it's interesting on the mask side we saw ours peak in the uh, probably around where, where you said michaela where we were before the holidays when, when numbers were really bad in wisconsin we were at in the 80s and now we've kind of gone the other way and the you know we're at it's almost 50-50 where it's, I, I will come if masks are required and about 50% are saying, I will not set foot in your building if you require masks. And it's North Central Wisconsin versus the Research Triangle uh, of Carolina. But, you know, and, and so that's gonna be one of the challenges too, is I think we are gonna have, uh, you know, uh, we're gonna have people on all sides, but people are pretty, have been pretty consistent since the very beginning of when will you come back it has never been, oh, when cases go down or you do that. Of course, you have the outliers who say, come, I'll come back today. Mm -hmm. You have the outliers who say, I'll never come back. And pretty much what we've seen is when I'm vaccinated or when cases drop to near zero. And that's just kind of what we've seen, you know, from April of last year to if I, the new survey results, we get them on Wednesday, it'll probably say the exact same thing. Um. That, that also reminded me that when we were doing our flurry of how do we reopen in a completely reworked sanitary, no contact facility in April. <laughs> um, one of the things that um, my, my colleagues and I in our department did was meet with our director of accessibility at KU um, and just go through our reopening plan. Um, she's incredible and very generous uh, with her time and um, great to work with. And so we went through our reopening plan kind of point by point and um, Catherine pointed out, um, you know, a lot of things that we hadn't thought of. And we certainly had questions um, for her, but you know, even things like for the tables where we were gonna have people 
people set their tickets to be scanned, you know, those need to be a certain height. Um, um, and, and so just able to kind of walk through that with us um, virtually and help us go through each thing and think about what we might need to um, add or change about that policy. And um, I also wanted to say that a lot of what she pointed out were things that would be helpful for not just patrons with specific accessibility needs, but for all patrons. So, you know, truly when you do that work and you go through, um, it's not just for, you know, one person or a small group of people, but you will find things that help out your entire um, organization and audience. So um, yeah, that was very, very helpful for us. Thank you for your question, Jamie. Um, are, you, are you hearing similar things from your patrons? Um, so we actually, I feel like we are an outlier because we have not really done many surveys, um, but we've, you know, through, uh, we're members with the NC Presenters Consortium, so we kind of have been keeping track through that um, and definitely hearing a lot of the same types of things. Um, I do think, you know, organization to organization, it also tends to vary some on the, like, we'll come back only if there's a mask mandate. We will not come anywhere near you if you have a mask mandate, which is an interesting dichotomy as well. Um, but I think we are going to start surveying as we are getting closer, um, particularly, sorry, I got here late, um, but I work with Pinecone in Raleigh, the Piedmont Council of Traditional Music. Uh, so one of our big programs is also a big bluegrass festival that we do in downtown Raleigh in the fall. And we had an hour and a half meeting yesterday around these so, you know, miraculous herd immunity and everything goes on back to 2019, completely virtual like we did this past year or something in the middle and spent most of the time talking about what something in the middle looks like. And I think that's where we're going to really start picking up the surveying to see what are people's appetites and comfort levels for like, okay, what if it's not all, you know, concentrated downtown? What if it's a stage at this park and a stage at that park and a stage down here and a stage down here. And you're not going to get to see everything and run back and forth between all the stages. Um, and it's, yeah, it's constantly aiming at a moving target to try to figure out what is viable and what is safe and what is a good experience. And just kind of, it's helpful to be here and hear all of this just to get some thoughts on like, you know, the digital ticketing question isn't one that we've really talked about much yet, um, but we also don't own our venue. So we are kind of at the mercy of the venues that we're in to say, what are you doing about ticketing? Because we have to be able to tell our people, but that means we need to have that communication and those conversations. And yeah, arts access is great. And I'm looking forward to hearing what they find and which, which ticketing system, Michaela, do y'all work with? Uh, we use Ticketmaster, and uh, I think the scanners are from Janam. if I had to take a guess. Okay. Yeah, I have no idea where the scanners come from, but uh, the Duke Energy yeah. Center is also on Ticketmaster, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I'd like to revisit uh, a couple of things. Um, going back to, Kate, what you were talking about with volunteers, um, you know, we again, we think that we're thinking a lot about the patron experience and, and how we can sort of plan in these two week chunks of how can I manage these two weeks of events? Uh -huh. um, um, but we do have to think um, sort of backwards from that. And how do we get our volunteers to come back and feel safe? How do we revamp our training for our staff, whether they're volunteer or paid? Um, how we're like, so like the prep work before we ever get there mm -hmm. um, and before we ever welcome the first patron back. Um, how, are, how are you all thinking about that? I mean, I have, I work with a, an all student staff uh, for my front of house staff, but I know that um, Kate, you are almost entirely volunteer. Uh, Michaela, you're kind of a mix and Sean, are you 100% volunteer? We have a few part-time staff, but mainly, mainly volunteer. So like, how, how are you thinking about that, that pressure, especially Kate, as you're saying, it's a, typically an older demographic and how do you, how do you broaden that pool of folks uh, and get the people who are willing to come, come back and help? These are excellent questions. Um, I think 
one one good thing is that um, the prospect of doing a virtual training or a series of virtual trainings for our ushers last March sounded a lot more, um, you know, a lot harder to pull off than it does now when so many of the ushers um, have, um, you know, gotten in the Zoom groove, coming to our virtual shows. Um, so that is, a, that's, you know, certainly not, probably not all of the ushers um, would be keen on that, but definitely that like sort of comfort with the virtual space, I think is so much greater now. Um, so, you know, there would, there's going to have to be a lot of a virtual component and whether that is, you um, Zoom conversations or um, whether that is making some video content for YouTube that ushers can just um, watch, you know, as they're able to, um, maybe doing some phone conversations with a few people. Um, one thing that I'm I'm trying to find a balance of is are we going to need fewer ushers if they're if the audience size is smaller or will we need the same number of volunteers because we'll have more to manage and it will be more in depth um you know what are what do those types of things look like um and then I have always wanted to create long-term relationships with ushers and have people who are well-trained, who get to know the facility really well, um, who become friends with the other ushers and create that kind of lasting institutional bond. But um, it is possible that we'll need to look into maybe um, trying to bring in some students for a couple of shows who may just come and kind of um, get briefed that night and work that show and, you know, come ask questions if they need to, but maybe aren't going to be the long-term, um, decades-long um, volunteers who, you know, um, know every nook and cranny of the building. Um, so just being a little bit more flexible on, on that as well. Those are a few of the things that I've been thinking about. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a, a really important point that, 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 we're looking at that we realize that you know every show may not be okay it's uh 26 volunteers who have all been with us a combined you know 200 years and okay let's put the three new volunteers with those 26 other <laughs> well, it could be a night where it's like the other way around we've got the three experienced ones on the 26 who are who have barely figured out where the restrooms are and you know where the intermission drinks are and so we're going to have to be more adaptable but you know I think in terms of training, yeah, definitely virtual and those things. But I think also just, I think tone's going to be really important. You know, they're already going to be a little skittish or you know, concerned, especially because of the demographic. And so I think the more that we can show that, hey, we've got it together, but we're also going to be learning and figuring it out. And I feel like we're in a little bit better place than that than we would have been a couple of years ago because my, you know, my general manager, took over our volunteer training actually a couple of years ago. We had had a long time volunteer coordinator retired and she took it over and I love that she said, you know, she said, I feel like we try to train these people like they're us, like they're staff and therefore they should know exactly what to do in the event of this and exactly know what to do, exactly what to do, you know, and she's like, and they come out of these meetings just like, I thought working at the Grand was fun, but apparently <laughs> The exit signs have radioactive <laughs> material and there's a one in one trillion chance that they would fall and that they might break and that and you know and they don't really have a safe space for a tornado and of course there's been a tornado in Wausau, Wisconsin in 100 years and so we tried to focus in on the hey here are the big picture things that we need for you to be courteous we need you to be on time we need you to be patron centric we need you to know the building and then the next level of things, we need you to know the things that are never acceptable, you know, that are never going to fly. And then that next level down, have enough common sense in an emergency, you know, you don't abandon your post and go running out the front door, you know, but we're also not expecting you to at that minute go, now exactly what door are you going to go out of and how are you going to lead those people and whatever. I mean, that's why we have professional staff and, you know, it sort of fit, fit, fit back to our changing our whole front of house uh, sort of viewpoint, which uh, again, my, my GM's uh, been doing this for a long, long time. And, and I love that she has the ability to sort of boil it down. And she goes, yeah, well, you know this manual? She said, but our front of house, our patroning strategy is going to be treat people like they're a guest in your home. And she said, you know, when you have somebody over at your house, 
it doesn't mean you don't have rules. Somebody dances on your table, you go, get out, you know, but somebody, you offer them a beer, you don't, or, you know, you don't offer them a drink because you're like, you had two at dinner, I've heard, and so you don't need a third one because I know how you get, you're an adult and you let them be an adult and you do that. And so I think that's sort of the way that we viewed, uh, you know, patron engagement and transferring that to the, to the volunteer world. These are, they're going to be a little freaked out, a little skittish. So the more that we can just say, hey, we're going to all figure this out together, it's going to be really helpful. Sean, I just, I'm going to tip my hat with a little insider knowledge. Um, I know that when you got to Wisconsin, what, six years ago, um, you, you rebooted the patron experience the idea of the patron experience in your venue. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, just in our last few minutes yeah. together and and maybe if there are any lessons that you learned then that might apply to sort of our post COVID era. Absolutely, you know, a long, many, many years ago in my previous life in athletics, I heard a, a president of an NFL team that was consistently going one in 15, two in 14 say, yeah, we have a terrible team on the field, but I'm committed to having the best patron, the best customer, the best fan experience I can have. And I was like, that's crazy. They talked about all the other things they did. And I started thinking about it in terms of shows, you know, you and I can go to the same show and I can love it and you can hate it, but we both need to have a good experience at the show. And so we started transferring our patron experience from our patron experience was kind of like, we have the show, we give you the show, we're nice, we're friendly, but we have rules and, you know, you don't take your drinks into the theater and, you know, our website is certainly what we want our website to be. Now you needed to be and you know, subscribers, you don't get exchanges. We, we were very much a, a black and white organization that we put up obstacles to the patron experience. And so everything we did was with the name of, you know, if I'm coming to a ship, let's see it through the patron's eyes. It doesn't mean you don't have rules and you don't have things you can and can't do. I mean, it's, it's like, okay, like Taylor talked about, there are things you just can't budge on. But the idea of without patrons, we don't have anything else. And so, how can we put their needs first? And I think that it was good that we did that because it served us very well during this whole process. And um, did you learn any any lesson, any specific lessons, like? Uh, you had mentioned your website or um, like the drinks in the auditorium. Are there any things that you think will help you in thinking about what might what might change after COVID? Yeah, I think the the biggest thing that we learned, and it's simple, is actually listening to them and hearing what their feedback is. And so mm -hmm. it, it helped us to say, "Hey, let's do a trivia night," as opposed to "Why would we do that?" We're a foreign arts organization. Okay, it's what people want, so we'll do it. Now, on the flip side. What we're hearing from our audience is don't throw all these things away when you go back to having shows in person. You know, I, I don't drive at night or, you know, I live far away and or I don't have the economic wherewithal. So, you know, we're going to redouble our efforts toward how do we continue to present, you know, compelling online content to reach those people that we had never reached before March of 2020 that we need to reach again and or we need to continue to reach. So that's probably the biggest lesson. That's a simple one listen to the audience yeah Michaela Kate are you do you think your organizations will continue to present virtual content I think we will I think we will possibly have some virtual aspect I don't know that we will continue to present virtual content and we never have go gone so far as to do ticketed like paid ticketed virtual content um we had one show last December, that was a show that happens every year um, that we did have a, a paid virtual show for. And it was fun, it, we learned a lot um, and it worked out well. Um, but I know that uh, I believe our audience does mostly wanna be back here um, in person. Although our tech staff and graphic designer have really become aces with, uh, <laughs> with some of the either live streaming or more video production side. So um, we don't wanna lose their uh, awesome city limits level uh, uh, technical prowess. Um, but I think we probably will not do a ton of virtual um, except perhaps you know if we're getting feedback that people do want that in case they're sick or in case, you know, can't come that night or in case, you know, um, they wouldn't be able to attend otherwise. 
that's my hunch. Yeah, I I think our hope is just to be so busy with in-person events that we won't have time for virtual, I think is what we're planning on. Um, if I had to talk to the promoter and our uh, booker about that. Um, but we, I think, have only uh, partnered with maybe two or three other um, ticketed virtual performances that did not, I wouldn't say they didn't go well, but they did not sell well. Um, it just doesn't feel like our audience is interested in that. Um, I think we're nearing the end of our, our time. We have a few more minutes if there are other questions. Um, anyone have any, any for our experts, our wonderful experts here? Okay, well, I, uh, I do appreciate your time, all of you, Sean, Michaela, Kate, um, and all of our guests. Uh, I think this has been a really interesting conversation for me, certainly, um, and I do encourage you all to, to reach out to us uh, if you have questions or if you wanna continue this conversation. I think I speak on behalf of our facilitators, I think uh, that um, we certainly would be willing to, to continue conversations with you if you have questions. Um, and then just on a selfish note, I uh, hope that you'll continue to check our digital commons programming at carolinaperformingarts.org. Um, and again, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining this conversation. Appreciate seeing you all. Thanks everyone, it was really fun. Thank you.